Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Melanie Dizon. I'm the Director of Education and Research at the Davis Finney Foundation and I'm super glad to have you all here today. We're going to be talking about telemedicine and Parkinson's. Uh, we have Roseanne Dobkin here. She is a, a member of our Science Advisory Board and has done a lot of work in the telemedicine field and we also have Ray Dorsey. Uh, we actually funded a study a long time ago around telemedicine and so he's been doing a lot of work in his area. We're excited to talk to him. And we also have Sonia Mather, who's going to be our moderator today. And I'm going to turn it over to her in just a minute. But I uh, just want to go through a couple of things real quick with you. Um, I have turned on um, closed captioning. So you should be seeing that on the bottom of your screen. If you do not want to see it throughout the time, there's a little um, icon at the bottom of your screen that says live transcript. If you click the little arrow, um, you can click it and say hide subtitle. So if you don't like that showing up on your screen, you can hide that. Um, there's a little box, another icon on the bottom that says chat. Uh, it would be great right now if you click that, it should open to a little um, pop up on the right and just say hello. Let us know that you can hear us and see us and tell us where you're calling from so we can say hello to you. And um, we are going to be, oops, I don't hear anybody. Okay, there we go. Hello from Canada. Great. Sarnia, Canada, Dayton, Ohio. Hello, Cheryl. Um, okay, so if you want to um, send us a question, you can um, see the little blue box at the bottom of your chat screen and it says, probably says all panelists and attendees or all panelists. And if you just want us to see it, then you can send it um, through there and not the rest of the audience will see it. If you want everybody who's watching and listening to, to see your question, which sometimes is really great because people have uh, chime in and, and help you out, um, then click all panelists and attendees. And this way people will be able to see it. Uh, I think that's all I have. Make, uh, please know that if you have to leave early, we will send you the recording of the video of the audio and a transcript so that you can get everything that you need. And um, we will also send you whatever links that we talk about in here. So if we're going fast and someone's saying a link and you don't feel like you got it, um, Lee is like really fast on the trigger. She's behind the scenes and she will probably put the link up before you even have time to ask the question. And um, if not, we will get it to you in the, in the follow-up uh, emails. Okay, so I'm gonna hand it over to uh, Sonia. She is a member of our board of directors, is a former family physician, been living with Parkinson's for over 20 years. And so I know she's gonna bring a lot to this conversation. Thank you all so much for being here. I'm gonna turn off my video and I'll just be in the background. Okay. Thank you, Mel. Good afternoon, everyone. For those I have sort of met before in this virtual forum, hello again. For those of you who don't know me, as Mel said, my name is Sonia Mather. I'm a family physician, and I've lived with young onset Parkinson's for the, probably about 22 years, having been diagnosed around the age of 28. I have the privilege of serving on the board of directors for the Davis Kinney Foundation, and I have the true pleasure of being your moderator today. As part of our efforts to provide you with information on living well with Parkinson's disease, today we will be exploring the practice of telehealth or telemedicine and how, how it may impact the way you manage your disease. If there are really any potential good things that have come out of this awful pandemic, one, one I would say is definitely the rapid timeline and collaboration that it took to get a number of COVID vaccines on the market to help protect us from this global crisis which makes me as an aside wonder why the same degree of expediting the research and collaboration can't be made in the search for a cure for Parkinson's, but that's a whole other discussion. But the positive thing, another positive thing is how the healthcare system was able to pivot and bring telemedicine to the forefront, making it a viable alternative, not necessarily a replacement for, but alternative to in-person medical care. Not that it didn't exist before, but it's certainly being used more extensively given today's circumstances. So joining us today, as Mel said, uh, to explore this important and timely topic are Dr. Roseanne Dopkin and Dr. Ray Dorsey. Dr. Dopkin is a licensed psychologist with a well-established clinical research program in Parkinson's mental health, focusing on the interplay between physical and mental health. And she's also very interested in examining the barriers to mental health care and the use of telemedicine to increase access to specialized care. Welcome, Dr. Dopkin. Hello, thank you for having me. It's our pleasure. And Dr. Dorsey is a professor of neurology and director of the Center for Health and Technology at the University of Rochester Medical Center. He's the author, the co-author of Ending Parkinson's. This is an excellent book that inspired the global advocacy group that helped co-found the PD Avengers. 
Dr. Dorsey has extensive experience in web-based conferencing to provide care to people with Parkinson's. Welcome, Dr. Dorsey. Thank you very much, and please call me Ray. Great. Okay, Ray. <laughs> so happy to have you both here with us this afternoon. Ray, perhaps you can start off by maybe defining what exactly is meant by telemedicine, the term, and how it's, it's used to sort of evolved in your practice pre-pandemic and maybe post-pandemic. Uh, perfect. Uh, before I do that, I first want to thank uh, uh, the Davis Finney Foundation, Davis Finney, Mel, uh, you, uh, Polly Dawkins. Um, you know, it's not easy having Parkinson's disease. It's not easy having Parkinson's disease and putting yourself out there as a face for the community like you're doing, Sonia, like Davis Finney has done. And it's not easy to form a foundation that's focused on enabling people with a debilitating disease to live better. Um, so huge thanks and appreciation to Davis Finney and the Davis Finney Foundation uh, for all of their efforts. Um, so telemedicine is nothing more than delivering healthcare uh, using the internet. Uh, that's all it is. It's not new. It's been around for well over 20 uh, plus years. The first applications of it in Parkinson's disease, I think, are from the 20th century. Um, a group out of Kansas uh, started caring for people with Parkinson's disease who lived, you know, three hours. I saw someone from Omaha, not Nebraska, I mean from Nebraska, but uh, I think they're probably people from Kansas who might be participating. And they didn't live near the University of Kansas in Lawrence and they need, had Parkinson's disease and they wanted to get it expert care. And the fundamental promise premise of, of uh, telemedicine is to enable anyone anywhere to receive the care that they need. I think you start from the frame point that anyone anywhere with Parkinson's disease should be able to receive the care that they need. And especially in the wealthiest country in the world that spends you know, 40% more in healthcare than any other country in the world, that's certainly achievable. Um, we started doing it in 2007, initially caring for nursing home residents in New Hartford, New York. And essentially since 2013, I've been seeing patients almost exclusively via telemedicine. So I had the least disrupted practice uh, by the COVID pandemic. Uh, it didn't, a minimal uh, disruption to our telemedicine uh, practices. And, you know, I'll tell you just one little vignette. In the midst of it, we had someone from Northern Italy who was literally couldn't leave his house and he couldn't connect to his uh, physicians in Italy. And so somehow he emailed me in the midst of the pandemic in March and said, would you be willing uh, to see me via telemedicine? And I saw him and we had a nice little conversation with him living in his uh, little apartment in uh, Northern Italy and I provided him some advice uh, to help him out. That's amazing. So you're, you're, as you said, your practice hasn't changed very much then pre and post pandemic. What about yours, uh, Dr. Dopkin? How do you feel about the changes that have occurred recently or have there been for you? Mm -hmm. So. Um, like Ray said, please call me Roseanne. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, very similarly to, to what Ray was describing, I have been doing um, a lot of research um, and a little bit of clinical practice um, in the area of telemedicine, um, specifically to leverage access to specialized mental health care for people with Parkinson's disease and their family members. I want to say since about 2010, 2011. Um, so prior to the pandemic, you know, most of the telemedicine work that I was able to deliver was in the context of research protocols and clinical trials, um, a few small um, clinical contracts that I had, um, as well as some consulting that I do um, for the VA, where telemedicine, fortunately, um, has been implemented um, as, you know, a main mechanism for providing clinical care for quite some time. Um, when the pandemic hit and restrictions around um, telemedicine requirements were loosened and or lifted, my entire clinical practice um, transformed from being, you know, traditional brick and mortar come to my office um, to a telemedicine practice. And, and it's really been amazing. It's been easier um, for the individuals that I work with to obtain care on a regular basis. Their mental health care was uninterrupted, thankfully, especially considering all of the additional stressors um, that COVID uh, and the isolation um, and lifestyle changes that go along with it, you know, have, have placed on the Parkinson's community as, as well as everybody else. And I've been able to field referrals um, and provide consultation and follow-up care to individuals who live two or three hours away um, that otherwise would not be able to get to my office on a regular basis, but I've been able to reach out um, and provide ongoing mental health care. So I think that this has a tremendous silver lining, um, probably 
probably one of the few silver linings to the pandemic. And I really hope that we can all work together as a community so that telemedicine can remain um, a main pathway for providing informed care, um, even after COVID is behind us. I think you're absolutely right. I mean, Parkinson's disease is socially isolating and there's problems with mobility at the best of times, let alone during the pandemic, where I'm sure access to care has been very difficult for a lot of patients. Now you mentioned um, restrictions and I was wondering, I know there's probably a number of legal and professional obligations that physicians must follow in order to use telemedicine. Um, what are some of those guidelines? What do you as a physician have to make sure is in place? Uh, this can be for Roseanne or, or Ray. Um, in order to practice telemedicine. Mm -hmm. um, so I, mean, I can certainly share some insights and I would love um, you know, Ray to, to share his perspective as well. I, you know, state licensing laws are very important um, to, to be mindful of. So you know, prior to the COVID pandemic, um, if an individual was practicing telemedicine, one had to be licensed in the state um, where they were sitting um, as the provider, as well as in the state where the patient was sitting. So I know both Ray and myself maintain licenses in, in multiple states. Um, a lot of providers um, are not able um, to do so, but um, I know we both um, carry multiple licenses. Those restrictions um, were somewhat loosened or lifted um, in the COVID pandemic, but not 100%. So federally, um, the government said, it, you know, it's it's okay, um, you know, from the federal perspective, if you're not licensed, um, you know, in the state where the patient is residing, as long as you're licensed in the state where you're practicing. However, we have to follow what the state says. And so most states um, have not loosened um, those restrictions or they loosen them very temporarily. So for example, um, there was one state where I was looking to see if I could follow some patients you know, on a consistent basis. And they said, well, you know, if you join our list um, and you sign up with our telehealth, Health registry, you know, you can certainly practice over state lines and provide mental health care here. And when I looked into what was required in order to join the registry, it probably would have been easier for me to actually get licensed in that state. So um, it, it kind of varies um, state by state with respect to what's required. So there's some easing of restrictions, but we have to be very careful as providers that we're following the rules of the state in which we're practicing as well as the state in which the patient is living. Great. Um, so the big issue here is Medicare. Um, so why did we see a 100-fold increase in the adoption of telemedicine in the midst of the COVID pandemic among Medicare beneficiaries? Is because Medicare made temporary changes to its coverage of telemedicine. Pre-COVID, Medicare didn't care about telemedicine and really restricted it. They spent less than 0.1% of their budget on telemedicine. Yeah. They said the only people who can get telemedicine are those who live in health professional shortage areas and only those people who go to clinics to receive that care. And that designation of health professionals shortage could change. In the midst of the COVID-19 pandemic, the great silver lining is Medicare got rid of those restrictions. They said that any Medicare beneficiary anywhere in the country, regardless of location, their home, their parking lot, their workplace can receive care and that care will be reimbursed for it. And uh, it doesn't matter the geography, the, doesn't have to be a health professional shortage area. It could be in Manhattan, New York. It could be in Long Island, New York. It can be in the middle of Los Angeles. Um, you don't need to drive to see your doctor. And it can be from a wide range of clinicians. So it can be from mental health counselors. It can be from speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy. It can be from doctors. It can be from surgeons. And all that would be covered. All those changes are temporary. They are tied to the public health emergency. Absent legislation, they will go away. So if you think telemedicine is uh, helpful to you, and we'll talk a little bit about why it is, uh, you need to make your voices heard. You need to tell your representative, you need to tell your senator that telemedicine needs to be a permanent part of Medicare's coverage. And if you have any question about this, you have been paying into Medicare, some of you for over 50 years, right? For 50 years, the whole purpose of Medicare, the only the reason it was created in 1965 was to guarantee access to uh, healthcare for older Americans in 1965, 50% of older Americans didn't have that access to care. We need to stop discriminating based on ge geography and be equitable uh, and inclusive in our de uh, delivery of care so that anyone anywhere can be able to receive that care. It's your taxpayer dollars. You should determine how they are spent, not government agencies. It's your money. 
Mm -hmm. It's called action. Mm -hmm. And I, I just, I want to underscore a couple of really important points um, related to what Ray just said. One of, I think, the really amazing aspects of the emergency legislation is that telehealth to home services are reimbursable, which means patients do not have to travel. You know, prior to COVID, individuals had to typically go to another clinic. Um, and it was clinic to clinic telehealth. And now we can do telehealth directly to home, which is really what is needed in order to remove barriers to accessing specialized care. Um, because going to one clinic versus another doesn't make all that much of a difference. Being able to receive services in the comfort of your own home from an expert in the field makes a huge difference. Um, and I think the other key point to keep in mind as we are all speaking um, with our senators and um, representatives is that one of the main changes, at least in my opinion, that is helping so many people um, to receive care via telemedicine is that right now there's telemedicine parity. So providers are being reimbursed at the same level if they're providing a service via telemedicine versus in person in the clinic. Um, this is really important because it gives a psychologist like myself the opportunity to go to my administrator and say, I want 20 um, telehealth appointments each week and they're not gonna say no. Um, if they're not reimbursed for my time at the same rate, then that's gonna be another barrier to care. So it's important, you know, as we continue to advocate for what we need for the Parkinson's community moving forward, it's not just Medicare um, coverage and reimbursement for telemedicine, but it's telemedicine to home and parity of reimbursement, you know, reimbursement at the same level, because that's going to enable all types of multidisciplinary providers to continue to provide personalized and highly specialized care. I mean, that's, that's really quite interesting. And I'm just wondering, because I mean, you know, these things are usually money-based, funding-based. Um, what would you say is the reason that Medicare doesn't want to, you know, keep the same coverage for is it that you can see more patients, which is a good advantage, actually? I'm just wondering about why, why that would be. You know, that's a great question um, to which I, I probably don't have a complete or, or comprehensive answer. Um, you know, historically, there was reimbursement, but under only very limited circumstances. I think in the long run, this would actually save Medicare money because when people get specialized care, they do better physically, um, they do better emotionally, they do better cognitively, and it can really help to prevent longer term, you know, morbidity um, and, and mortality. Um, but, but, but it's unclear, um, at least in my opinion, um, why there, there might potentially be some resistance, but I bet um, Ray may have some perspective as well. Medicare doesn't fundamentally care about you. Who does Medicare hear from? They hear from hospitals and doctors. And so what's Medicare's reimbursement set up for is to reward doctors and hospitals. Do you need any example of it? Medicare would be delighted for you to fracture your hip because uh, hospitals or hospitals would be delighted for you to fracture your hip because they get paid $20,000 to repair your hip. Uh, you know, a physical therapist might get paid $50 to prevent you from uh, fracturing their hip. Yeah. And if you don't make your voices heard, if the 1.2 million Americans with Parkinson's disease don't make their voices heard, and you rely on what hospitals and physicians are going to do, they're going to act in their best interest and not in your best interest. Your best interest is, and the reason, and who funds Medicare is you. You are the ones who fund Medicare for the last 50 years. You've been paying 2.58% of your of your income for 50 years. Tell Medicare you, and your congressman and your senator and your congresswoman that you want uh, telemedicine to be permanently covered and so that you can receive your care regardless of who you are and where you live. It's a fundamental right. Yeah, that's great. And as I said, it's a great call to action for the people that are tuning in today. Um, Roseanne, you alluded to it and I'm just wondering, Ray, if you know, or, or Roseanne, of course, as well, have there been studies that looked at outcomes of for patients that uh, comparing both in-person medical visits to telehealth visits, do we have data on that? 
Uh, I think we both have data on that. Um, certainly, I can speak from, from the mental health perspective. I could probably speak for you know 10 hours from the mental health perspective, but I'll try to do it in a minute. So um, I've run several clinical trials um, looking at the feasibility and the effectiveness of delivering um, cognitive behavioral therapy and other types of psychotherapy via telemedicine, both audio only, you know, using telephone, um, as well as web-based video conferencing. And I am so happy to report that across three separate randomized controlled trials, the amount of improvement that we see over the course of three to four months of weekly mental health treatment is identical down to the decimal point. Um, if we provide therapy, um, you know, face-to-face -face in the office versus face-to-face -face over the web or, or even on the phone. So absolutely nothing is lost in terms of efficacy or effectiveness, but so much is gained in terms of our ability to expand our reach and to provide evidence-based mental health care um, to individuals who really need it, which ultimately enhances and improves overall global PD health outcomes. Right. Uh, can, can can highlight that a lot of research has shown this. Uh, a lot of, some of the research was funded by the Davis Finney Foundation for our, our work, which is generally shown in randomized controlled trials that it's feasible. The show rate is higher uh, via telemedicine than it is in person. It's a huge issue in uh, mental health. Um, generates comparable outcomes to usual care. Uh, what every telemedicine study shows Every time, I don't think I've seen one that hasn't, uh, or it's shown the opposite, is uh, patients love it. Uh, mm -hmm. Patient satisfaction is uniformly high. Every single telemedicine study shows that patients love it. Uh, it saves patients on average three hours of time and 100 miles of travel uh, per visit. Some patients in one of our studies even preferred the personal connection to their virtual doctor that they had never met before compared to their usual in-person doctor with whom they had a pre-existing relationship. And that's not always the case. And there can be bad uh, telemedicine doctors, just like there can be uh, doctors who don't provide the quite the quality of care that they should in person. But the winners for telemedicine repeatedly are those uh, who um, are patients. The other thing is we've just done a huge natural, a national experiment in which 25, Medicare, 25 million Medicare beneficiaries, half of them, many of them probably listening, maybe 100 of the people listening, I'd love to hear from them, have gotten telemedicine. So the, who's better positioned to determine uh, whether telemedicine is effective or not than the people who paid for it and are receiving the care? They're the people whose voices we should listen to. And my guess is the vast majority have had positive experiences. And most studies that have been coming out over the last year suggest that that's the case. Mm -hmm. So we have, you know, increased accessibility. We have the quality of care doesn't suffer. We've got increased patient satisfaction with the logistical side of things and no real um, dent in the rapport that you can develop with your clinician. Are there other advantages for patients that we haven't mentioned to um, get involved with a telemedicine um, follow-up? I'll start and then let Roseanne add. Uh, we. Uh, the five C's. So there are five C's for telemedicine. One, reduce contagion. So you don't get COVID mm -hmm. by going to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And you may laugh or you may mock, but there are people who got sick from COVID because they mm -hmm. went to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And those hospitals, some of them didn't do testing of their healthcare workers. And they should be held accountable for their inability to protect patients. You should not go to a hospital and get sick or get worse. And that has happened. It happened too much. It's not Oops, I think we might have lost Ray. Rosanne, do you want to pick up? Sure, I, absolutely. Um, you know, I, I think, you know, cold. what? Oh, oh, sorry, we lost you for a period of time when you were talking about the hospital and people getting sick. Yeah, Just sorry. So the first of things, reduce contagion. People are getting sick from getting exposed to healthcare workers, many of whom weren't getting regular testing because hospitals and medical centers weren't doing regular testing to protect right. patients. There are right. people who got infected with COVID-19 and had adverse health consequences because they got it at the hospital or they got it in the clinic. That should mm -hmm. not be permissible, right? We should be testing people to decrease the risk of it. Now, some of it's going to be inevitable when you have a pandemic, but there are insufficient protections for people. So one, reduce contagion. Second is increased, uh, is improved, is increased access to care. So you can get the care regardless of where you live. Third is a convenience. We talked about 100 miles of travel and three hours of time, huge thing. Uh, 
Um, next is comfort. People are in their own home. It's a lot more comfortable to be in your own, own home. Uh, people, you know, there's a less of a power asymmetry. I'm six foot five. So if I'm standing in a clinic and I got a big white coat and you're on an exam table wearing a gown, you can imagine the power asymmetry that's, that's there. So people are more comfortable talking about everything, whether it's social, their sexual history or, you know, mental health. And the last part is uh, increased confidentiality. You know, you go to a Parkinson's clinic, you're basically telling the world that you have Parkinson's disease and not everyone wants to know that, uh, wants to broadcast that they have Parkinson's disease. We need some people to be voices for the disease, but not everyone for whatever reasons are comfortable letting the world know. So reduced contagion, care, convenience, comfort, and confidentiality. Anything you want to add to that, Rosanne? I think that there's also significant potential for increased um, adherence to therapy, which then leads to better outcomes over time, particularly in areas like mental health or speech or even PT or OT, which again, during the pandemic went virtual with really good outcomes. You know, many of these multidisciplinary services require participants, participants, I'm thinking about studies, um, individuals to you know, come and join and take part in the intervention, sometimes once a week, sometimes multiple times a week. And if you're doing it from the comfort of home, your ability to follow through and engage and adhere um, to what's recommended is going to, to increase. And when we have higher rates of adherence, we have better outcomes. Yeah, that makes sense too. Um, one of our viewers is asking that, obviously, when they see their neurologist, there's a lot of hands-on sort of physical testing that happens. And so how can this be carried out through telehealth? So the exam's right. not as good. Um, it's just. Yeah. So we just keep, uh, we keep, we keep running out. It's good. It's okay. Sorry, Andy, sure. it's not as good. Yeah, so some, the exam sometimes not as good and sometimes Having been through um, an exam myself, neurology exam myself, I can tell you that, yeah, it perhaps isn't as good, but they have ways of sort of watching you on video that can sometimes give them some information. Um, and so, you know, it may not be complete, but it, it, they do. They do see me. Sorry, you cut out again, right? I'm sorry. Um, so... <laughs> Sometimes you can't do it. And sometimes, you know, your initial evaluation needs to be done in person, not always. Right. Percent of diagnoses, you're a doctor, 80% of diagnoses are based on history. Yeah. So if you're 55 years old and you've got an asymmetric breast tremor in your right hand, you know, the, diff the list of possibilities gets very short, very fast. Right. Um, and so sometimes it's, you don't need it. You know, Dr. Parkinson in 1817 described six people with right. Parkinson's disease, half of whom he never examined. Exactly. The seminal description of Parkinson's disease is based purely on observation. Um, so uh, there are some cases where you need to come in, that deep brain stimulation evaluation, those kinds of things you, you do need to, but you no know, follow-up evaluations for DBS, for example, could be done remotely. I'll let uh, Roseanne uh, answer. Yeah, that's what I was wondering, because sometimes you do need to lay hands on a patient. Um, and so there, there must be maybe atypical presentations or, or what, what situations would you say the DBS, new DBS patients? Are there other scenarios that you feel cannot be taken care of over telemedicine? I don't like to make blanket statements. Um, sure. You know, we've diagnosed progressive supranuclear palsy, you know, all these random uh, diseases. Sometimes you need to sure. have imaging. Sometimes you need to have blood work. Sometimes right. you need to lay hands on the people. You know, telemedicine is not as good as, you know, video conferencing is not a good for forming a relationship as an in-person encounter. Telemedicine is not as good for doing an exam as an in-person encounter but it is a great way to get social history, right? You know, right. you get a sense of what people's living environment is. Do they have adequate social support? Do they have friends? Do they have family? Do they have dogs? Do they have, you know, uh, any number of different things that you can see uh, by seeing someone in their home. Um, so there are limitations. It's not a panacea by any stretch of the imagination, but there are lots of advantages to it. The gold standard, by the way, for all this is not a clinic appointment. The gold standard for patient-centered care is a house call where Dr. Dobkin goes to somebody's house and sees in their home environment. Exactly. If that's the gold standard. That's what we're trying to strive for. And then how do we get to that? In some cases, you know, we can't. Sometimes we can do house calls. Sometimes we do mm -hmm. a virtual house call. Sometimes we do a clinic appointment. And in some cases, it might be some combination thereof that's optimal for people. 
But what we should stop doing is stop discrimination, stop discriminating based on geography, stop asking sick patients to see healthy clinicians on our terms and start asking healthy clinicians to see sick patients on theirs. That makes, that makes really good sense. Yeah, I mean, and I think the other point to emphasize here is that I don't think anybody is suggesting or advocating for telemedicine to replace in-person right. care, but it should be an equal and equivalent option. You know, right. we want to personalize care. We want to give individuals a voice and a say in their care. Um, you know, if an individual prefers going to the clinic, then that's wonderful, but maybe they prefer telemedicine and they should have just as much right, um, you know, to exercise their voice and to receive the type of personalized tailored care that's going to be best for them. Um, and, you know, Medicare, or Medicaid shouldn't get to decide what type of care is best for each individual patient. That is a decision that should be made case by case based on individualized assessment um, and ongoing conversation between each person with Parkinson's um, and their providers. I think that's absolutely true. I mean, you know, since we don't have a biomarker, you, you as clinicians rely a lot on patient history or recollection of what their symptoms are, as well as maybe your examination. But, um, you know, going to a, a, a city to go to see a specialist with traffic, the, you know, the timing, I mean, everything can really affect. So the clinical snapshot that you get in, in the office might not actually be reflective of their environment, what, what they're like in their own home. So I think that that really does make very good sense. Mm -hmm. um, but that ties into a question that we also had about wearables, sort of getting a picture of what the patient is like. Is the wearables something that can be tied into telemedicine, if viewer wants to know? Yeah, so I think uh, it's all the same question. You know, telemedicine is not just video conferencing. That's, you know, the near-term easiest uh, application mm -hmm. uh, that can be done. Um, but you think about it, you know, uh, what does a doctor make his decision based on, or her decision uh, based on? You know, it's based on infrequent uh, encounters in artificial yeah. environments at arbitrary times. You know, just like we know that your blood pressure in the clinic may not reflect what your blood pressure is at home, your walking ability in the clinic uh, doesn't necessarily reflect your walking ability in the home. Yeah. I'll give you a vignette. I saw a patient actually in clinic. And I thought they looked fine, uh, and then they were they were also a friend, and so we went to lunch uh, right afterwards. And then I saw that person getting out of their car, and they couldn't get out of their car. Yeah. I felt like such a heel for like you know completely missing that this person is not functioning at their highest level, and that they were in, being inappropriately undertreated until I saw them in their natural uh, environment. So I think in, in the future we're going to see a lot of these wearables, you know, um, uh, measuring people's disease and give us uh, insights uh, that we never thought was possible before and that and, and leave it lead us to uh, uh, an era of precision medicine where uh, our decisions are based on how people are functioning in their real world environment not how they're just functioning in an artificial environment that's great um maybe let's get back to some of the logistics about how this takes place um first of all i was wondering how do not, not everyone is doing telemedicine and i would imagine not everyone's offering those services but so how do you find out whether you're who is seeing patients? Can you can you be referred to a new doctor in this day and age when you haven't seen them in person before? Or how do you access a movement disorder specialist as a patient if yours is not, not offering telemedicine alternatives or options? Ray or Roseanne? I'm going to let uh, Roseanne go first. Uh, so I, I think um, if an individual is interested in receiving medical care or mental health care um, via telemedicine, you know, the best option is to first figure out who you might like to see, um, you know, based on their reputation and their experience, and then to contact that office directly and to ask um, if appointments are being made via telemedicine, are new patient appointments being made via telemedicine, um, and, and how does that work? So for example, you know, what type of technology um, is the office implementing um, in order to make the televisit happen? Because there are, there are a lot of different platforms out there. So for example, you know, at Rutgers, we are able to use um, HIPAA compliant version of Zoom um, to do video encounters. We can also use um, DoxyMe. We can use um, something called Doximity. So there, there are a lot of different options available. 
Most of them involve um, emailing a secure link um, to the patient and they click on the link to start their appointment. And then, you know, you're, you're both on the screen together. Um, you know, some doctors may be able to offer audio only appointments, um, which are also covered under Medicare right now. Although I will say that, you know, audio only is very, very limiting for a lot of reasons. Um, and I think it's better to be on video, um, but audio is certainly better than not having an appointment at all. Um, but, but I think inquiring um, with each individual's doctor's office to figure out, okay, what are their policies and procedures and then taking it from there. I think you have to look at why we deliver the care that we do. And the answer is because that's what the incentives are. Um, it makes little sense to provide care for people with Parkinson's disease to ask people with impaired driving ability to be driven by overburdened caregivers to uh, centers that require considerable mobility and cognitive function to navigate. Right. If you were designing it from scratch, you wouldn't couldn't come up with a much worse solution than you <laughs> currently do. Um, and you should get pissed off about that. And you know, 1.2 million people with Parkinson's disease should say, you know, I've been paying into Medicare for 50 years for the exact purpose to provide me the care that I need. Should I get a condition associated with aging? And if the economic incentives, and they are, are such that they get medical centers get twice as much money when they get see, have you come see us on our terms than when I see you on your terms, you can imagine what medical centers want, what care that they want to provide. I'll give you an example. Partners, the two biggest hospitals in Boston, Massachusetts General Hospital and Brigham Women's make $50 million a year on parking revenue a year. So you think about what the economic incentives are and that's what they're being delivered. When 1.2 million people say we should have telemedicine should be paid on par with in-person care or maybe even more because we think it's better because it saves us money and time, uh, then you're gonna get to see a lot of telemedicine and care will be much more accessible. But if you don't make your voices heard, rest assured hospitals and physicians will make their voices heard. Seems like there has to be a paradigm shift, really. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, and, I, and I also want to point out that I think that the no-show and cancellation rate across the board is much lower um, with telemedicine because there are fewer barriers that prevent individuals from being able to reach that appointment with their provider. Right. Um, you mentioned, you were mentioning technology, Roseanne. What does the patient need on their end in terms of technology in order to carry through with a, a telemedicine visit? So typically, you know, there, there are a variety of, of different platforms um, that are workable. A smartphone is just fine, um, or certainly a desktop um, or a laptop computer, um, an iPad can work. Even um, individuals who have maybe an older computer um, that doesn't have a built-in camera, you can order, you know, a webcam um, from let's say Amazon or Best Buy, maybe for $25 or less, um, and, and you know just stick it on um, the, the laptop or the desktop, and then there would be that video option. So um, there are inexpensive sort of add-ons um, to equipment that people already have in their homes that can make the television visit possible. Um, it's actually a lot easier than people think it is. And what I usually recommend, and this has worked very well, um, to do a test call, you know, before the actual appointment. Oftentimes, there are clinic staff that would be more than willing to, to run the test call um, with the individual prior to the appointment to make sure the technology is working. Um, or even do a test call um, with a friend. Let's say it's a platform like Zoom. You can practice connecting and make sure that you have audio and video and, and everything's working. Or sometimes for the first visit, um, the individual who's scheduled for the appointment will have a friend or family member in the background, you know, to make sure they can get connected and they can get online. So there are a lot of ways um, to troubleshoot and to make sure the technology works. Um, but most of the time, it's really just clicking on a link and then you're in, you're in the room, you're in the virtual room with your provider. Um, and it's really simple and it's really fun. I agree completely with everything on Roseanne's uh, just uh, articulated. Two just uh, caveats. One is a lot of people don't have access to this technology. So 20% of households in the United States lack broadband access. We need to make broadband access universal so that everyone can use it, whether it's for healthcare or education, for example. And the third is 20% of phone, uh, households don't have smartphones. And so 
some people are going to need care, you know, whether that's someone going into the home uh, to provide them uh, that access to care, whether that's a satellite clinic like a federally qualified health center in their area or a senior center or a library or a post office uh, that can be used as a means uh, for delivering care. But we need to make sure that anyone anywhere can receive the care regardless of who they are and where they live. Right. So what, I guess, what should patients know about the appointment in order to get prepared for it? What do you tell your patients that they need to do to get the most out of that particular visit with either of you? Is there information that they need to have on hand? Should they have their caregiver on hand, not just to make sure they connect, but that they can give their own history or take on what's happening in the, in the home? Or what do, you, what do you suggest? So I think in addition to you know, testing out the technology um, in advance if possible, and then having somebody, at least for that first appointment nearby, um, to help troubleshoot. I usually recommend that individuals you sort of write down um, or with the help um, of a friend or family member, sort of prepare a list um, of all of the questions that they have, all of the key points that they wanna make sure that they address in the context of that initial conversation. Because I will say sometimes when we bring the technology into the equation, people can get distracted um, initially by the process and then they may forget some of um, the clinical material that they'd like to discuss and talk through. So I think the more prepared they can be in terms of jotting down some notes or an outline um, for the session, the better, and possibly even having a family member sit in and participate um, in part of the evaluation or treatment session if they feel comfortable doing so. I agree completely. And uh, we put together a video on what patients should do to prepare for telemedicine. We get put together videos on like what clinicians should do to prepare for telemedicine. We put one on what patients should do and we'll send a link to Mel uh, a after this uh, call. But I think Great. You, it's your visit, your time, be your advocate, come out with your three questions or top five concerns that you want addressed. And some of those concerns can be from, from fans and family members, but you know, if you're organized and you know, you come out with your agenda about what you want to get out of the visit, whether that's in person or by video, that's critical. Are other allied health professionals also providing this type of service? Like how does a physio do a telehealth appointment in your, in your clinics? Have you any experience with how other health, allied health professionals are working? So I have a patient in like upstate New York, near Vermont, near Canada, and he participates twice a week in online physical therapy uh, with a hundred of his newest friends, all connected by video and the physical therapist wow. is in Boston. Um, so uh, I think we're just scratching the surface of what's uh, possible. Uh, speech therapy is extremely uh, valuable to be done uh, by telemedicine, especially if your audio doesn't break up. Um, you know, counseling, uh, nutrition, social work, uh, genetic counseling, the uh, Parkinson's Foundation is doing work on that. We're just scratching the surface of what's possible. We can deliver wide range of medical services to people in their homes without them ever having to travel. What a wonderful thing and why we should be embracing uh, the myriad of possibilities that are out there to be had. Mm -hmm. I 125% agree with everything that, that Ray just said. Um, you know, any service that can be provided in person, uh, or I shouldn't say any, but the overwhelming majority of services that can be provided in person can be provided via telemedicine. Skilled providers provide excellent care if they're doing it in the office or if they're doing it virtually. Um, and everything is case by case. And yes, they're going to be certain presenting problems and certain procedures that may not be as amenable to a telemedicine visit compared to others. Um, but the overwhelming majority of the time, if the patient and the provider agree that this would be an appropriate way to receive care, it's most likely going to be an appropriate and effective way to receive care. And what do you um, foresee for the future for telemedicine in terms of, of you know, future technology or, or what, what do you see coming on the horizon in, in order to add to the telehealth we have now? 
I mean, I like we've been talking about, I think it's so important. I think the time is now for all of us to raise our hands uh, and raise our voices and speak up and advocate for what we need, uh, that we need the coverage that we currently have to be maintained um, and to continue to grow because we want to move forward. Um, we don't want to move backwards. We want to continue to overcome um, barriers to specialized care. We do not want to introduce new ones. So I think we need to, you know, send emails and make phone calls and send letters and, you know, shout it from the rooftops that we deserve the best possible care out there. And we deserve personalized medicine and it needs to be accessible. Right. I, think I I'll mean, also in terms of technology, do you foresee anything that's coming to our, our time, I guess? Yeah, I think, um, uh, we're coming very close to a time where your smartphone, your smartwatch is going to tell you whether you have Parkinson's disease or not, uh, mm -hmm. or tell you whether you're likely to have high probability of having it. Uh, many people in the world today are undiagnosed with Parkinson's disease, so they're suffering in silence. A study done in the U.S., the last one in the 1970s, suggested 40% of people with Parkinson's disease are undiagnosed. The least in proportion is 12% in Rotterdam, Beijing's 50%, rural Bolivia's 100%. I think people are going to have be carrying around devices that they're using for communications and entertainment and other things, and that those devices are going to tell you with a high degree of probability whether you might have a Parkinson's disease or not. And then those same devices then are going to be able to connect you to care. So it's going to say, you know, you have a high probability you look like you might have Parkinson's disease based on changes in your gait. And can we connect you to clinician uh, to be evaluated for that? I think we're just scratching the surface of what's possible, and that increasingly these, these devices will serve as platforms to enable large portions of the world's population to be diagnosed with different diseases and to receive care for those conditions. Yeah, I think, I mean, there has to be such a paradigm shift that it's gonna take a while for people to get, you, you know, um, get out of their comfort zone with what's already in practice. You know, we all all sort of get used to what we have and to make changes in that way um, can be difficult. Um, this may seem a little off topic, but actually it's relevant. Many people are in a situation where they have to attend medical appointments virtually because of the circumstances of the pandemic and where they find themselves is really more socially isolated at home. What general advice do you have, Roseanne, to help them support their mental health through this time? Just a couple of things that you think are important. Yeah, so, so that's a great question. Um, just like we've been talking about the potential you know, of, of telemedicine to sort of leverage access um, to specialized care. I think it also provides a really important opportunity to stay connected, maybe in alternative ways, um, you know, during these challenging times. So I've had coffee with friends um, over Zoom. I've had Zoom happy hours with people. So I think finding a way to reach out to other people um, in a safe, an appropriate manner considering the world that we're living in right now um, is, is critically important. You know, we have to maintain social connections. So it might be virtual. Um, it might be, you know, in warmer climates, getting together outdoors, you know, in smaller groups with, with our masks. Um, I have some folks that I've worked with go through the drive-through um, at Starbucks and they each get a cup of coffee and they sit in their own car and they roll down the window and, and they talk to one another. So kind of finding creative ways to connect with other people. Um, I, I think it's really critical. Um, in addition to keeping up with our exercise and setting goals every day and trying to superimpose some routine and some structure um, in a world that seems to, to very much lack that routine and structure, you know, what can we do to schedule things for ourselves um, each and every day? And I always go back to, to my doc in three, you know, if we're up to me, everybody should have a minimum of three goals per day. One's an exercise goal, um, one's a social goal, and one's something else that just feels good and it's meaningful and it's rewarding and it's satisfying. You know, maybe it's listening to, to Billy Joel or, um, you know, reading your favorite author or binge watching something on Netflix, but what feels good to you? What's meaningful to you and making sure you do that each day? I would say this, get vaccinated. Um, you know, these vaccines are as effective as me as vaccines for measles, at least that's what the evidence suggests uh, to date. You know, very, very few of us wouldn't tell our kids uh, to not get vaccinated for measles. Um, 
the safety in these clinical trials, at least to date, uh, suggests a high degree of safety. Uh, you're going to see, and we are seeing death rates decline as we are vaccinating the older adults uh, with who, uh, older adults, especially those living in nursing homes. Um, as we vaccinate more and more people, uh, we're going to uh, prevent uh, deaths and premature uh, deaths. It's quite clear that you know 40 to 45 percent of uh, deaths have happened among nursing home residents, of whom at least seven percent have Parkinson disease. We need to make uh, people who have the opportunity to get vaccinated should take advantage of that, uh, of that opportunity so that we can turn the tide on this uh, pandemic and move uh, to a world where we can engage with one another uh, in a wide variety of uh, media. Absolutely. So the, we mentioned, I mentioned in the beginning that the COVID vaccine came because of all, all the clinical research that was accelerated. What's happened in Parkinson's research? Has telemedicine played a role in that and keeping our clinical trials or some of them going. What's been either of your experiences with clinical trials during this time in telemedicine or tele, I guess, technology in general? Mm -hmm. So I guess in some ways I'm lucky because for the past several years, um, all of my research has been conducted remotely since I've been researching telemedicine and its applications to mental health. So I, I fortunately haven't been too impacted um, by the pandemic in terms of keeping my research up and running. I know I've got colleagues that have taken more traditional protocols that were clinic-based and they've created the opportunity for virtual visits and virtual assessments, which has enabled um, science to continue to make progress. Um, not all researchers, I think, have been able to, to, to do that, um, you know, to completely switch gears, but some have, um, and, and I think that that's been really nice to see. Just like we uh, should bring care to patients, we should bring research opportunities to research participants. There's no reason we should be asking research participants who, who are generally have sick to uh, volunteer to participate in research studies, to be exposed to known and unknown risks, and to do so on the terms of investigators and centers. We should bring research studies directly to uh, participants. In some cases, some of the assessments will need to be done in person, but the vast majority can be done remotely. More generally, we need an operation warp speed for Parkinson's disease. Yes, yes. <laughs> so we spend 200, and I spends $200 million a year on Parkinson's disease research. The economic burden of Parkinson's disease in the United States is $50 billion, $50 billion. So we spend less than 1% of, uh, of uh, resources on biomedical research funded by taxpayers uh, compared to the economic burden. Economic burden of Parkinson's disease is $25,000 a year just in healthcare delivery, the vast majority of which is spent by Medicare. So we can do a lot of $100 telemedicine visits. You could do a telemedicine visit every uh, month for a physical therapist, a mental health counselor, and a physician, and be spending $1,200. It'd be rounding error in the grand scheme of things. And we need to substantially increase our uh, funding for uh, Parkinson's research by tenfold. When we've done that, whether it's for COVID, whether it's for polio, or whether it's for HIV, you know, all being funded 10 times more than Parkinson's. HIV receives 10 times more NIH funding, more than 10 times than Parkinson's. The same number of individuals are infected, and that's led to uh, highly effective treatments for that have made HIV a disease with a near normal life expectancy and prevented thousands, if not millions, of people from ever developing the disease in the first place, including people like me and you know many of you who were probably would have had HIV, but for the voices of HIV activists. If we get an operation warp speed for Parkinson's disease, we can prevent people from ever getting the disease in the first place by getting rid of some pesticides and chemicals linked to the disease. And we can develop new therapies in a short period of time uh, to help the people already with the disease and likely do so within the lifetimes of people listening to this call right now. Ray, would you like to share your upcoming campaign to help with that funding request? So we got the PD Avengers who are making their voices <laughs> heard, like Sonia. Uh, and so we wrote this book called Ending Parkinson's Disease. And in it, we highlight that Parkinson's disease went from a, a extraordinarily rare disease in 1817 when Dr. James Parkinson described it to one to the world's fastest growing brain disease uh, in 200 years. From a very rare disease to the world's fastest growing brain disease in the span of 200 years. And so we're starting a red letter campaign that uh, modeled on the March of Dimes and the theme of the campaign is we give a dime about Parkinson's. And if you email us at info at endingpd.org, info at endingpd.org, we'll send you a red letter that's addressed to the White House that asks uh, the 
president to do three things. The first is to ban chemicals that are linked to Parkinson's disease, including the pesticides Paraquat and Chlorpyrifos, and this chemical called trichloroethylene, widely used in electronics and degreasing. The second is that we're going to ask that Medicare make its coverage of telemedicine permanent. Uh, and the third is that we're going to ask the NIH to increase its funding tenfold. And so if you want to give a dime about Parkinson's and we give a dime about Parkinson's, we can change the course of the disease. We need to make our voices heard. We're going to send 1,000 letters. We're going to ask 1,000 people from the Parkinson's community, including you listening right now, to send a red letter to the White House. We'll provide you the red letter. We'll provide you the stamp. We'll give you a space for you to write your own personalized message. Just email us at info at endingpd.org. And then join us on March 16th, in which my co-authors, Todd Scher from the Michael J. Fox Foundation, Michael Oaken from the Parkinson's Foundation, and Boss Bloom from the Netherlands uh, join together to make our voices heard so we can make uh, ban chemicals linked to the disease, prevent people from ever developing it, make Medicare's coverage of telemedicine permanent, and start a Operation Warp Speed by increasing NIH funding for Parkinson's disease tenfold. It's, it's such a great campaign and so easy for people to participate, you know, with such little effort they have to make, but can make such, such a significant impact. It's, it's really Listen, great. David Spinney has like put his life, you know, out there for the Parkinson's community. Absolutely. You know, right? It is not easy having Parkinson's disease. It's not easy having Parkinson's disease at a young age or an old age. And it's not easy being the face for a disease, right? You know, mm -hmm. he's putting himself out there as a face for disease. We should match the efforts of the David Spinney's of the world, of the Brian Grant's of the world, the Michael J. Fox's of the world, the, the Sonia Mathers of the world and make our voices heard. And that's the only way that change happens is once you encounter resistance, that's the definition of making progress is that you're encountering resistance and we haven't encountered resistance because we have failed to make our voices heard and our inability to make our voices heard has led to too much suffering, needless and preventable suffering that we need to stop. Yeah, we have to be louder. <laughs> as, as you start to wrap, wrap up, just to go back to the telemedicine issue, if, if I, I just wanna ask each of you this question, if I, as a patient, am going to attend my first telehealth appointment and I'm nervous or kind of skeptical about the level of care I'm going to receive, what words of reassurance or confidence do you have for me? Roseanne, maybe you start. So a good doctor, an excellent doctor is an excellent doctor. And, you know, I, I stand by this and I mean this, you know, from the bottom of my heart that the care that is provided via telemedicine from a, care, from a compassionate and skilled provider um, is excellent care. Uh, I don't personally believe that anything is lost um, in terms of the quality um, of the encounter that is provided via telemedicine. If there are technical glitches along the way, um, the provider will work with you to, to work around them, um, but you will have the same amount of time um, to ask your questions and to have your questions answered and to tell your story um, and to have your voice heard and to really receive personalized feedback about what can be done in order to best help you um, to manage and improve the symptoms that you may be struggling with. So I don't think that this is inferior in any way. Quite frankly, I would argue the opposite. This is superior care, that you're going to get better quality care in many instances um, via a telemedicine encounter. So first of all, you don't have to do telemedicine. You can go see the doctor, lots of doctors, 99% of doctors visits, well, a large 90% of doctors visits are still done in person. So you, if you really want to, you can uh, do that. And that's fine. And that can be the right solution for a large portion uh, of the population. But if you grew up, you know, watching Dick Tracy or the Jetsons, uh, you saw that telemedicine was, you know, envisioned in the 1970s. And so here we are 50 years later uh, using a technology that's, you know, been around with us uh, for a long period of time. And usually, you know, 10 to 15 minutes into the visit, people go, oh, I can see the doctor and I don't have to travel. So if you really like to travel in the snow and you like to drive to Rochester when it's 20 degrees and it snowed six inches, and you really want your uh, spouse to take off time from her work or her volunteer job, and you really like the parking lots, and you like to pay for parking, and you like the waiting room, and you like seeing the receptionist, and you like uh, going to the doctor's visit, and you like the checkout thing, and you like driving back, then fantastic. You know, in-person care is uh, available. But if you think there's a better way, if you think that clinicians should see you on your terms in your own environment at your convenience, 
then uh, try out telemedicine and see if you like it. And if you don't, in some cases, it's not the right solution. And you can always go see a clinician uh, in person. Thank you so much. So we're coming to the end of our time together. And thank you both, really, Ray and Suzanne, uh, Roseanne, so much for all your insight and sharing your experience. It was really, really greatly appreciated. Um, I want to thank everyone who tuned in as well for joining us today, your questions and your comments that you wrote in the chat. I hope that you found your time with us helpful and educational. And always remember, I, and it's the same way, but it's, it's true. You may not have control over your diagnosis, but how you face the challenges that this diagnosis brings into your life is really yours to determine. So focus on optimizing your quality of life, educate yourself, empower yourself, and celebrate your daily victories. Until next time, thank you everyone.